So Vector's mission is to drive excellence in leadership and Canada's knowledge, creation, and use of artificial intelligence to foster economic growth and improve the lives of Canadians. And our research community is now over 700 members strong. This includes our faculty members, several of whom are with us today giving talks, and the majority of those hold Canada CIFAR AI chairs. Our community also includes more than 100 faculty affiliates, 51 postdoctoral fellows, 410 graduate student researchers, and a vibrant group of undergraduate researchers. Now, Canada has three national AI institutes, Vector in Toronto, Mila in Montreal, and Amy in Edmonton. Each of these institutes has a kind of senior scientific leader whose research program was and is still fundamental to the formation of that institute. And our chief scientific advisor is Jeffrey Hinton. So uh, at Vector, we have uh, a number of faculty who are pushing the boundaries of machine learning and deep learning. I'm gonna show you very quickly three slides of faculty uh, arranged by uh, in alphabetical order. Um, you see on this page, Jeff is there, he's gonna be talking today, uh, Shai Ben David, as well as Amir Masood Fermon. All three of them talking today ended up on this first slide uh, by, by chance. Uh, and then flipping onwards, um, we have various faculty members, many of them advancing a trustworthy AI. And we also have many fac uh, faculty members who are uh, applying AI to improve health outcomes and advanced materials and drug discovery. So Vector is connected to a large ecosystem, the entire Canadian AI ecosystem, and that includes not just the other institutes I mentioned before, but more than 20 universities, many industry sponsors across different sectors, and hundreds of startups and scale-ups. And a few uh, key points I'd like to share with you, in a five years since our inception, more than 2,000 students have graduated from Vector-recognized AI programs and study paths, We've secured more than $100 million in research funding, and Vector faculty members have earned nearly 100 research awards. So we're launching a visiting researchers program this year, and we'd love to discuss that further with our colleagues at RICAN. Uh, we have a robust postdoctoral fellowship program and a research internship program that's open to students around the world. And today, I hope to see some collaboration opportunities uh, highlighted uh, between RICAN and Vector faculty. Stanford's Human-Centered AI Institute ranked Canada fifth overall in its 2021 Global Vibrancy AI Index. And a prominent US thought leader wrote that Vector represents one of the most ambitious efforts in North America to upgrade a strong ecosystem into a world-class position. So thanks for listening to my spiel about Vector. I thank our government uh, funders and uh, CIFAR, as well as our industry sponsors, because we wouldn't be here without them. Good evening, everybody. So I heard that there was a daylight saving in Canada a few weeks ago. So everybody has to shift the time for one hour. So I'm sorry to hear that, but hope that you can enjoy the workshop to the end today. So, okay, I'm Masashi Sugiyama. I'm director of Weekend AIP, Weekend Center for Advanced Intelligence Project. So let me briefly talk about Weekend. And the first question I need to answer is, what is Weekend? So, Riken, so our name is Rikagaku Kenkyujo in, in Japanese, so consisting of six, six letters like this. The first three letters are pronounced as Rikagaku, and this basically means physics and chemistry. Then the last three letters is pronounced Kenkyusho, so this is a research institute. But six letters are actually too long in Japanese, so nobody calls us Rikagaku Kenkyujo, but people call us just Riken, so take one character here and one character here and this one. So then at some point, Riken headquarters decided to use this acronym, Japanese acronym, Riken, as the official English name. So our name, Riken, is not an acronym anymore. It's the official name of the institute. So Riken is a national research center in Japan. And in principle, it is in completely independent of universities. But many members also have joint affiliations to universities. Like I, I'm also a professor at the University of Tokyo. And I'm at the same time, I direct out Riken AIP. So what is Riken AIP? So Riken actually has a history of more than 130 years. It's actually quite old. And then Riken founded Center for Advanced Intelligence Project in 2016. 
So under the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, MEX. So we are actually a 10-year project center, and already it is the seventh year for us. And we are actually located in the center of Tokyo. So this is our office is actually located in, on this building and on the 15th floor so somewhere here. So this is about 10 minutes walk from the central Tokyo station. And then we have a nice open discussion space in, in, in this building. And also we have in-house GPU servers somewhere. So we are in the center as a main, main office, but our teams are distributed across different universities from Sendai, to Nagoya, Kyoto, and Fukuoka, depending on the teams. And we have three research groups. And the first group is called Generic Technology Research Group. So here we have 12 teams working on machine learning and inference algorithms or statistical and optimization theory. So this group consists of full of like basic researchers working on the theory and algorithms. Then the second group is called Goal-Oriented Technology Research Group. So they are, in principle, more applied people working on AI for science, like including cancer research, material science, and genomics, and also AI for societal problems in, in Japan. Like we have a lot of natural disasters in Japan, and also elderly healthcare is an urgent issue. And also nowadays, education is also a big issue, so including chat GPT issues. Then finally, uh, AI in society research group. So they are more like social science side and they are working on six, six teams and they are working on personal data management, AI security, economy management, and ethics and governance. So we have three groups and in total 45 teams. And among 45 teams, so 10 teams are like purely, you know, Riken and other like 35 PIs are coming from universities. And this is rough statistics. So we have about 130 employed researchers and we have actually quite high diversity and 40% of the researchers are international and about quarter are female. And we have about 250 visiting researchers from universities and industries. And also we have 130 domestic students as part-time researchers. Then, so before COVID-19, so we invited interns every year and we had 140 international interns previously. But in the last three years, we had to stop the internship program. But from this year, we resumed the intensive program and hope that we have quite a number of visiting interns in this summer and autumn. So hope that through this workshop, we can exchange students and researchers between Vector and Japan, uh, Rick and AIP. And also we are quite active in having extensive collaborations. So we have about 40 international collaboration partners and also we have 40 more industry projects. So hope that we can extend our network through uh, this uh, joint, joint workshop today. Uh, hello from Vancouver. The sun is beginning to set over snow-capped mountains outside my window here. So it's a pleasure to join you from halfway across the world. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about video pre-training or learning to act by watching unlabeled online videos. I'm gonna unpack that. Uh, and I'm currently at UBC in the Vector Institute, um, but this is work that was done by my team at OpenAI. So I want to give, when I was at OpenAI, so I want to give a huge thanks to this wonderful team of hardworking, talented collaborators. So the general idea here is that I work on reinforcement learning, which is kind of learning via trial and error um, and having computers do that. And a main challenge in this space is exploration. So, you know, roughly speaking, the, the, what RL does is it tries a bunch of stuff. And if it figures out something that's high rewarding, it tries to learn to do more of that. The problem is that if you never stumble upon anything that's high rewarding, then how is the algorithm going to learn anything? That's the challenge of exploration. And there have been many, many uh, approaches over the year. They often look to think something called intrinsic motivation. So if the external reward function is not telling me what to do, like I want a robot to clean my house and I'm only gonna say good job if it actually cleans the whole house. Well, the robot might not randomly be able to do that, but if it can just be interested in producing new situations, new states, then maybe eventually it will produce a clean room and get the good job and therefore be able to learn. So people have been doing this for decades, myself included. Um, and you know, recently we had this paper in Nature that kind of showed that a lot of those methods still aren't solving really hard exploration problems 
And there's a couple of reasons why. I'm not going to go into them in detail. But if you do this kind of algorithm that we had called Go Explore, then you can end up going and solving some of these historically kind of these grand challenges in the area of art exploration challenges. So here's a game in the Atari benchmark that if you see here, almost every algorithm up until Go Explore had performed quite poorly on. And then, man, this massive spike once you kind of handle exploration better. And now are you seeing a graph with yeah. scores? OK, I think we're good now. OK, so here are all the previous attempts on this particular game, almost zero points. And then here is what happens, I think, when you handle some of the pathologies in exploration in this Go Explore algorithm. It ended up solving kind of all of the unsolved challenges on the Atari benchmark suite and even helped this robot figure out a hard exploration task of putting toys away where it only gets reward once it successfully picks up a toy and puts it on the shelf. So I think it basically why am I telling you this? It's because I think exploration is an important topic and there's huge gains to be had if we do it right. And intrinsic motivation, which is our historic attempt to solve this problem, works okay, but not great. We have some new algorithms like Go Explore, like I mentioned, but they're kind of handcrafted and they haven't been proven kind of in general in places like hard 3D um, games and like using your computer. And so it's not yet clear what we might, like how, to what extent this algorithm will work. And so I just wanted to raise in this talk that there might be a different way, which is to take a page out of the modern playbook of unsupervised learning and see whether or not we can solve exploration in a totally different way than Go Explore does. And so to borrow from Isaac Newton, I think AI sees further by standing on the shoulders of giant human data sets. And that's been a lesson of CLIP and GPT and DALI and AlphaStar and things like that. And so if you think about it, the internet is full of videos of how to do really hard things like manipulate photos in Photoshop or play Minecraft or even like a video of a robot um, cleaning up a house or using Gmail, et cetera. And so what we want to do in this work is try to harness the GPT playbook, which is to say, first pre-train on noisy internet scale data, then try to fine tune with RL and see if that can help us profit. So our hypothesis is that pre-training by watching YouTube will provide what we call a behavioral prior that allows an agent to kind of out of the gate zero shot, know how to do things in a, in a, in a particular domain, and that will enable it to learn tasks that are otherwise completely unlearnable. And so normal exploration, which is what typically happens in RL, is exceptionally stupid. Basically, we just take random actions and hope something good happens. A behavioral prior, for example, in this situation that you see below, might come into the world saying, oh, I know that those are chests. I know that I should open chests. I also know the actions that I need to take to open chests. In this situation, that seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do. Why don't I go see if there's something inside that chest? And that would be great to have inside of our algorithms and way better than historically what we do, which is just randomly mashing buttons and hoping something will happen. So the domain we chose for this project is Minecraft. We did that for a number of reasons. It's an extremely hard exploration domain because it's this vast open-ended world where you can do almost anything. Uh, there's also a tremendous amount of video on of people playing Minecraft on the internet. I think it's probably the maybe most of the, the, the video on the internet is people playing Minecraft, or at least that's the largest subset. Um, but I want to emphasize our we are not trying to solve Minecraft here. This method is extremely general and can help, like for example, with learning how to do anything on a computer and potentially even beyond with robotics. So another thing we wanted to do is try to use the most generic action space. So we just go from pixels to the same interface humans use, which is to say moving a mouse or a trackpad using a keyboard with keyboard strokes and at high frequency, like 20 hertz. So historically, almost every RL major advance, like StarCraft, Dota, things like this, they've simplified the problem tremendously to create an action space that is very friendly to reinforcement learning algorithms. But if we really want to go solve arbitrary challenges, we have to push our algorithms to the limit and use high dimensional action spaces that were not designed because our RL algorithms aren't that sophisticated yet. So um, that's nice about that is that means that with this technique, if it works, which I'm going to show you and hopefully convince you that it does, it means that on the next domain, you don't have to custom design a new action space. You can just go with whatever that application already has. It's also lossless. If we see a human do something, then we know we can do it as well. So the challenge with this approach is that you can't just run GPT as normal. Why? Because videos on the internet are unlabeled. 
So if you're trying to predict the next text or the next word in an article or the next note in a song or the next pixel in an image, you have that information, those labels on the internet. You know what the next word is and the next pixel is. But for videos, you see somebody doing something on a computer like playing a video game, you don't actually know what buttons they're pressing and what mouse or joystick movements they're making. And that's what's missing. And that was like the central challenge of this work. So our idea is quite simple actually, is that we're gonna train what we call an inverse dynamics model. And all it does is it gets to look at the past and the future, say the last two seconds and the next two seconds. And it just has to tell us what action must have been taken right in the middle at time t. So for example, here, if you see the thing on the left and you see the thing on the right, you can infer that the jump action must have been pressed. That's all the IDM has to do. Now, once we train that IDM, we can then go to YouTube and have the IDM tell us, oh, it must have, they must have taken this action, then done this, then done this, and then this. That gives us labels for every single time step of a video that we find online. And then we can behavioral clone at scale in the GPT autoregressive sense, where I just go from the past only and say, what should the next action be? Send that to the, the domain, the game, the simulator, get back the next state and say, now what should the next action be? And the next action and the next action. So the final model ends up looking a lot like a normal neural net that just goes from past to next action. And, but we use this other model, this IDM to get the labels. And then we threw that IDM away and we just use the data with the labels to train the final behavioral clone model. So we did that on about eight years of YouTube data, data and trained a transformer with about a half a billion parameters uh, for the behavioral cloning policy. Now, why is that a good idea? Why does that work? Well, one thing is that behavioral cloning is really hard, right? To, to say what the next action should be, I have to look at a video, for example, or a, a frame like this thing on the left here. Graham, can you see my cursor? Yes, I can. Perfect. Yeah, so this frame here, you have to go from here to say, hey, what is the human trying to do? Are they trying to build a house? Are they trying to build a farm, et cetera? And then once you know what they're trying to do, you also have to know what is the right action to take to accomplish that goal. So that's a very difficult task. The IDM, in contrast, has this really easy task, which is I get to see the past and the future and just say what must have happened in the middle. So here's the method at the high level. We go to the internet, we collect as much data as we can. Then we're gonna train the labeling thing. How do we do that? Well, first we go to some contractors or your friends, have them play the domain of interest. So we had contractors play Minecraft for about 2000 hours. We record the actions while they play. So we have ground truth labels paired with videos. That allows us to train this adverse dynamics model. So look at past and future and infer what the label must have been in the middle. Once I have that IDM trained, I now can go to the internet Instead of 2,000 hours, I now have 70,000 hours. I can label all of those videos with this pseudo action, the predicted action of the IBM, then train my normal big transformer behavioral cloned imitation learn model that can go from past to next action. So first I want, uh, now I'm gonna show you a bunch of cool plots that I think show what the, uh, why this is, uh, what's going on here. So first of all, I just wanna, I've made this claim that, that doing the task of predicting the action when you get to see the past and the future is easier than just going from past to action. And so we can test that here in, um, this is loss, so lower is better. As you scale the number of hours of data, the IDM starts off at a better place and getting quickly becomes really, really good at its task. The learning slope is shallower when you have to go from past to future in this causal model. And that shows you you're gonna need a lot more data to get a comparable loss. In fact, it's about two orders of magnitude less efficient to do the from the past to the next action as opposed to seeing the future and the past. And that's why we think you can train an IDM with a little data and then unlock the large quantities of data you'll need to get from the internet to train a really good behaviorally cloned model. Here is our actual IDM performance as a function of data set size. So what you can see is as you add more data, contractor data, once you get to about 2000 hours, you're really almost perfect in your performance. Okay, so I just showed you about training the IDM and now I'm gonna show you about training what we call the foundation model, which is the equivalent of GPT, but for playing in this case, Minecraft. And coming out of pre-training, 
zero shot. We just put it in the environment and we see what it can do. We're showing you this across pre-training. So the final model, which you can see over here, learns to do some stuff that humans um, do in the game, which is pretty cool. Some of these are quite complicated, so I'll break it down. It does these really simple things like getting the early objects of the games like stone and logs and dirt. And it even can zero shot do things that take human on the order of almost a minute and about almost a thousand actions. So it's a really large amount of actions to do zero shot with no extra fine tuning. And here's some actual videos, which are fun. I'm not sure how well these are gonna fly across the ocean, but here we can see the agent hunting animals. It can swim, it can eat food, and it can even do this action that's kind of unique to Minecraft where you jump up and throw a block below you to build a big pillar so you can, I don't know, see off in the distance or something. All of this is just happening zero shot after watching YouTube. But what we can also do, like in GPT, is we can say, hey, I had this big train model. It was good at completing sentences and kind of doing anything I ask it to do. But it's not great maybe at answering questions or doing the SAT quest test or whatever. So I can fine tune it to a particular task and watch it get better. So what we did is we said, all right, we've trained on all YouTube videos of playing Minecraft, including learning how to do these esoteric things like build computers and play the end, the final boss. But we also will just focus on like maybe the stuff that's like really germane to the beginning of the game, because that's where we're evaluating our agent is kind of like the early couple of minutes. So we have our contractors just play the beginning of the game over and over and over again for 400 hours. And we fine tune to that. And look at this massive jump. So blue was like training on the whole Internet's data of Minecraft. Green is training on the Internet's of worth of data, then fine tuning to the early part of the game. And sometimes you see a 200x improvement in say making a crafting table, which is this essential thing you have to do at the beginning of the game or you can't do anything else. So that really unlocked kind of the power of this pre-trained model. And it's also the only time that we started seeing stone tools and wooden tools showing up in the game, which are more advanced things. So um, I also wanna show you that it's not just the fine tuning data. You might think, well, what happens if you only train on the fine tuning data itself? Well, you get performance over here. It's only by pre-training on this much data and then fine tuning on the early game data that you start to see the really complicated stuff like crafting tables and stone and, and uh, wooden tools show up. So here you have, um, let's see, some videos of what the agent, which is now pre-trained and then fine tuned can do. So it can like craft a stone pickaxe, it can make some wooden house, like a house basically. And it does a really good job of exploring this whole village opening doors, like opening chests, going into rooms, going into one house, going to the next house, et cetera. And I just want you to remember, like the whole point of this thing was to learn to explore and be good at exploration. So ultimately can learn hard tasks. Well, we basically have accomplished good exploration here. Look at this right video again of exploring a video of a village. So if ahead of time you had a task, like go find this kind of object, Odds are much better now this thing will find it and then you can reward it and it can learn to do that over and over than if you just take random actions. So now I will show you that that is true instead of just promising that it is true. So here what we're gonna do is we're now gonna take that model, the model I was just showing you do its thing and we're gonna further fine tune it, but this time with reinforcement learning. So instead of having any like do this action, then this action, then this action kind of stuff. Now we just give it a high level goal and we reward it if it does it. And it has all the challenges of RL like exploration, credit assignment, things like that. So the task that we picked for our model here is to create a diamond pickaxe, which is an extremely difficult task in Minecraft for RL agents. In fact, it's been the subject of many kind of challenges and competitions and no RL agent has ever gotten close to doing this. It takes humans about 24,000 actions to accomplish this and over 20 minutes of consecutive play. And these are skilled humans. So I just want you to think about how hard that is for an RL agent. And this is kind of the sequence of tasks you need to do in order to ultimately get a diamond pickaxe in this game. So we just kind of say, all right, we'll give you more points the deeper you get into this little tech tree. And here is probably the most important plot of this entire talk. The blue line here is if you do not pre-train, you take the exact same neural net, same 500 uh, million parameters, and you just do RL to, to, and you give it the same reward function, it learns almost nothing. It learns the most simple first task, which is make, getting logs. But if you pre-train on watching YouTube first and then do RL on top of that, then you can see 
that it slowly figures out how to do more and more complicated things and eventually gets all the way to performing diamond pickaxe, which as I said, is about 24,000 actions in a row to succeed. So this pre-training has really worked to enable RL to do a good job of exploring the domain and figuring out how to do hard tasks. So now I wanna show a little bit more information. One thing that was kind of cool to see is for all, everything except the last task, we, be, we were a human level in terms of the fraction of times we succeeded at doing that task, when a human is uh, tasked to do that. Uh, we looked at their success rate and then we compared it to our agent and we're a human level. And then we were about 2% of human level for this last step. Although I think if we just ran the algorithm longer, we would have closed that gap. So here I wanna give you a flavor of just how hard this is. So here the agent had to chop logs, chop a tree to get logs. Then it uses this little tiny interface that looks like a graphical user interface. And that's not a coincidence. We were trying to like prove that our stuff would work for learning how to use computers like Photoshop. So here you see it sees its cursor, it's dragging and dropping little items like you might drag a file around in your desktop and in your operating system, it's dropping things, it's clicking on things, et cetera. Then it places this crafting table, then it opens it up. And once again, it has a new interface, it crafts a new tool. Now here, it's actually has some long-term planning. It knows that in like 30 to 40 seconds, it's gonna need that crafting table again. So rather than immediately go down and just start getting the next reward, it actually breaks that crafting table, puts it back in its inventory, like its pocket, carries it with it down into the mines here. This is Minecraft after all. Now we're getting stone tools. Here I found some iron ore. It has to break this iron ore. It then has to, once it gets it here, it has to make and place a furnace. Uh, here we go. So now we're going to make a furnace. We're going to place a furnace. Then we have to put fuel under the coal, the iron ore on top, melt the iron ore, wait for it, get the iron ignites, do that a bunch of times. Now I have the resources to go and make iron tools. Still not done yet. I have to now go in search of, I believe it's now searching for diamonds. So that's a hard thing you're exploring all over. Eventually it finds some diamonds, here we go. It has to get enough of them. And then again, once one last time, it places a crafting table, opens that up and it can make its diamond pickaxe, which required all of those actions. So I hope that even if you don't care about Minecraft, then you just kind of, Think about like what you might be able to do in 20 minutes on your computer and apply this to that kind of setup. All right, so now we have um, one cool thing, which is a, I, I'm really excited about. Uh, we had this in our roadmap the whole time in the project, but we only got to it kind of toward the very end because it took us that long just to get VPT working. But I'm extremely excited about adding language and text conditioning to this kind of a system. So language, as we've seen so much recently in machine learning, it provides all sorts of beneficial things. It allows steerability. You can ask the agent to do a particular thing. That allows you to zero shot, perform new tasks. It allows generalization because you can kind of think in the space of language and compose and combine like different uh, words to have a, can, an open-ended task space. Uh, it's very expressive. You can ask for anything you want. And so the hypothesis is that we should be able to get the same benefits for embodied agents if we train at massive scale where they, you give them the past of the video and the goal in a text description, and then they tell you what the next action is. So the way that we did this is we had a, one extra simple thing, which is we said, hey, look, all of these YouTube videos where people are playing Minecraft, Oftentimes, there's like a narrator who's saying, hey, I think I want to build a house. First, I need to go get some logs. Then I need to do this. Then I need to do this. Oh, wait, that didn't work. I have to try that again. So they're planning and they're replanning and they're saying those things out loud. So we thought, let's just take the closed captions of the narrations as text, embed them into GPT, pass those embeddings into this model. And now it kind of knows what it's supposed to do in any situation. And it should learn to do the things that were stated as goals. And that then allows us to have steerability of the model. So here's some of the, the methods. You can look more in the paper if you want. And this is really early work. We didn't actually spend that much time tuning this. And so I think the sky's the limit if you push on this more. But roughly speaking, if you ask for seeds, it will go get seeds. If you ask it to get wood, it will go chop more logs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so it didn't always work. These are kind of some of the better examples that we found. But I think that this is signs of life that this approach will work. 
Okay, I want to do a few more analyses here. So one is, um, it turns out that if you, as I said before, if you don't pre-train, nothing happens in RL. That's the blue line, or almost nothing. And if you do our, the pre-training, you get to a diamond pickaxe. But it turns out that we had we needed that three-stage process where we pre-trained on all the data, then we fine-tuned on the early game, then we fine-tuned with RL. That's the green line. The red line is if you didn't do that middle stage of kind of the supervised fine-tuning to the early game. Um, and I have a feeling that with more training and better optimization, we could get rid of that middle step. But for now, if you're working on a project, uh, I think this is kind of a very helpful thing that can make everything easier, is to really kind of distill out the knowledge from the internet to the task you want the agent to be good at before you go off and do RL. Another thing that I think is really fascinating is that if you train from the pre-trained model, you know, the best pre-trained model, which is the one we use here in green, and you do RL vanilla, it doesn't work. That's the orange line here. So the thing that happens in green that I haven't said yet is that the entire time we're training this green line, we are doing a KL penalty to the original pre-trained model before RL. Now, why does that help? It becomes down to this long-standing thing we know about neural nets, which is that they experience catastrophic forgetting. So as the, as the model is learning how to do the early things, the early skills, it's throwing all of its weights and all of the gradient updates are trying to get better at all the stuff that's currently getting reward. And it's cannibalizing its knowledge for how to do skills later in the tech tree, like iron tools maybe, or stone tools while it's learning wood tools. But a KL penalty that a pre-trained model says, you're allowed to learn the new thing. You're allowed to like have your weights figure out how to do the, new, the things that's currently being rewarded better. But we also want you to kind of stay as close as possible to the original weights so that you preserve the skills that you're gonna need later on once you are deeper down into the tech tree. And so I thought this was like a really beautiful illustration that catastrophic forgetting is still a thing that we need to care about and how we can solve it, at least in this particular case. Um, right, all right. Uh, a couple more things on data scaling. One interesting finding is that after we did all of our work, we went back and realized we didn't actually need about 2000 hours of data. If we just go with 100 hours of contractor data, then our performance is roughly the same if we then use that model to label the internet and pre-train that model and see how well it does. So we probably could have gotten away with a very cheap amount of um, contractor data. The next thing I wanna say is that the um, VPT, the more data you have for pre-training, the better you end up doing at the end of this whole um, pipeline. And so basically, if you look on the left here, here's just taking like, you know, a couple thousand hours of data. And you could actually even just take your contractor data. You have labels, they're ground truth labels. So maybe I'll use them. So over here, we're actually just using the contractor data. Over here, we do the process of VPT, which is you use the contractor data to train the IDM, label the internet, that gives me more data to train on, and now I'm gonna use those perhaps noisy labels. And what you can see is you don't really get the complicated technological innovations showing up until you really unlock the internet's worth of data. You can't just get away with BCing on small amounts of data. So what's a way, one way to think about this is that it might take like a couple thousand dollars to get a small amount of labels, that allows you to unlock millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars of labeled data on YouTube and the internet. And that plot shows that that's a good idea. All right, some discussion points now. If you, a lot, I think we're probably all sold on self-supervised learning or unsupervised learning at this point. And many people think, oh, the way to learn from videos is to like predict future frames, right? Video, if, if image generation, like pixel by pixel is the way to learn cool concepts by, from images, and the way to do it for videos is just to predict future frames of the videos. And I think that that's pretty good. That probably will give you a representational prior, which means to say the, the, the system has learned to see the world. It understands that there are things like chests and trees. It might not know the words for them, but it knows what they are. But what it doesn't know is what to do in a situation when it sees chests. It just kind of knows what chests are. VPT in contrast gets you something that I think is strictly better, which is a behavioral prior. Not only does it know and see and understand the world, but it knows what to do, like literally that a chest should be opened and here are the atomic actions I need to take in order to open that chest. So a representational prior dropped in this situation would have no idea what to do because it doesn't know how to act. Whereas VPT, you put it in this world, it's gonna go and open a chest. And I think that's a nice difference between learning to act 
and getting a behavioral prior versus just doing self-supervised learning in a different way that would only give you a representational prior. Okay, so um, one other cool thing is that you might think like, how is this gonna work in general if I wanna watch all the videos on YouTube, not just for one domain? I don't wanna have to pay contractors for every domain. Well, we have a lot of ideas for how you might train a system that could kind of rapidly adapt to any new domain. But actually, there's this really cool paper that came out of Google Brain where they did a follow-up on VPT where they showed you can train kind of a generic IDM that you train it on a couple domains and it gives really well at predicting a new held out domain. So it just kind of figures out, roughly speaking, you know, what, what videos correspond with what actions, which is really cool to see. Okay, so uh, two slides of conclusions. VPT can learn to act from vast, noisy, unlabeled online video. I now hope that all of those words make sense. It learns this thing that we're calling a behavioral prior, which I think is likely better than a representational prior. We didn't actually do that science. I'd like to do that kind of more of like a self-supervised thing versus this thing and then train on those features. That would be cool for future work. But my money is on the behavioral prior. Uh, I think VPT is way better than just doing behavioral cloning. $2,000, for example, can get you over $20 million of uh, internet data. And VPT can use the human interface directly, mouse, keyboard, uh, at 20 hertz, et cetera. And so, as I mentioned, just think what you can accomplish in 20 minutes on your computer. There are already startups right now where people are trying to automate computer work by basically just doing behavioral cloning at scale on humans using computers. And I think this shows you that that is possible and that's coming. Uh, like GPT, we get really nice zero shot behavior and even better once we fine tune to um, really quickly learn uh, some particular subset of behavior that we're interested with. And then we can go from that to further fine tuning with reinforcement learning and that worked really well and ultimately allowed us to get those really ambitious goals in um, Minecraft, which has eluded the reinforcement community up until this point. So also important, the KL penalty helped prevent catastrophic forgetting by kind of keeping the skills that would be required for each next rung of the ladder while I'm learning those early runs. Uh, this is a kind of a classic open AI paper in which scaling helped. So more data helped, larger models helped, training longer helped. I didn't show you that in this particular talk, but our appendices are filled with plots that show all of those things. And overall, it basically learned to do really difficult tasks that take skilled humans over 20 minutes on a computer. And therefore, I expect the VPT will work really well for computer using agents because um, you know, there's not that much difference between using Minecraft and learning to do like use Microsoft Word or Google Docs, or et cetera. So uh, the final thing I wanna point out is that I'm just like over the moon in terms of my excitement for what happens when you start adding text to this. And you can basically ask the computer to do anything. You effectively could get a virtual assistant for free that could do all sorts of cool, complicated stuff on your computer, on the internet, et cetera. Of course, there are important safety concerns and sandboxing concerns we need to address for those people that will do that work, but at least we now know it's possible. So uh, if nothing else, we've raised it as a potential safety concern to start thinking about com uh, you know, computers, sorry, AI learning to use computers and do it really well. And with that, I want to thank my wonderful team of collaborators uh, again you know, at, at OpenAI, as well as all of the people at, at Raken and Vector for listening. I'm happy to take questions if there's time for that. Thank you. So I'm very pleased to be able to join the workshop with the Canadian Institute because as, Ma as Masashi said, I had a wonderful time in my postdoc time under the Yoshio Adventures Lab, Mila. So, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity and today I'm going to talk about the uh, p-values and the confidence intervals for deep neural networks. This is joint work with my students. So let me start from uh, motivating examples. We consider brain image analysis by deep neural network, uh, which looks something like this. The left two images contain tumors, while the right two images do not contain uh, tumor. So those are taken from healthy people. And uh, we're going to consider two problem setups here. The first problem is the uh, segmentation. Uh, first, we train a unit, like CNN for segmentation. And then uh, in the step two, uh, consider a case where given a test image, then we want to identify the tumor lesion by the trained deep neural network. And our question here is, how can we provide uh, 
statistical significance, for example, in the form of p-value to the obtained Im image segmentation result. In the second problem, uh, we're going to consider explanation, for example, by uh, CAM or GLAD CAM, any type of saliency methods. And uh, here, in step one, we train a CNN for classifying whether the given image is tumor or not. And in the step two, we're going to consider the case where, given a test image, we uh, want to provide the explanation by the trained DNN. Uh, the region where we pay attention to, to make a decision. And our question here is to, how can we provide the statistical significance, such as p-value or confidence interval, to the obtained salience region? Uh, we are going to think about those kind of uh, questions. So to do that, our strategies are as follows. First, we're going to consider a statistical hypothesis testing problem for these problem setups. And then we're going to employ so-called conditional selective inference. This is a new type of statistical inference method recently uh, developed uh, by the team in Stanford. And uh, uh, finally, in order to apply the conditional selective inference framework into the uh, deep neural network, we're going to introduce some uh, computational trick. So before going into the details of the methods and problem setup, uh, let me uh, provide the uh, examples of the results that we will have. So first is the uh, image segmentation results. Now we have uh, four results and two, uh, two the, first, the above two are positive cases, which means that it contains true brain tumors. And this is a segmentation result. And now we have two, type of, two types of p-value, naive p and selective p. Naive p is the p-value obtained by uh, forgetting everything about the fact that the image segmentation result is obtained by deep neural network. And the selective p is something uh, which we're going to propose in this talk. And in the case of positive cases with true brain tumor, uh, both naive p-value and selective p-value provides a very small p-value, 0, 0.000 in this case, which means that this is a, a true positive because we want to, uh, that there exists a true brain tumor and the, the deep neural network could identify the uh, tumor lesion correctly. On the other hand, the bottom two cases are negative cases. That means that without true brain tumors, uh, in that case, the naive p-value and the selective p-values are different. In the naive p-value, uh, which forgets about the fact that the segmentation result was obtained by deep neural network, provides, again, very small p-value, 0. 0.000. On the other hand, the selective p-value provides a uh, much greater value than the significant threshold, something like 0. 0.05. So this means that since this is a uh, image without true brain tumor, the result obtained by naive p-value is a false positive, while the result obtained by selective p-values is a true negative. So I want you to understand in my talk that uh, why uh, we can have a false positive in the case of naive p-value and how the selective p-value can uh, collect this bias. So this is uh, uh, examples of the second problem setup. Uh, brain image explanation result. Here, the problem setup is a little bit complicated. I will explain that in detail later, but uh, this is a, a brain image. And uh, uh, we applied uh, CAM and GLAD CAM to uh, this brain image. Then the GLAD CAM provides this uh, attention region. And we're going to uh, consider a threshold and uh, pick up the region where the pixel value is greater than the threshold, then we obtain uh, something like this. Now, doctors are interested in whether this attention region is something different from the normal cases. And the bottom one, this one is a normal case, where we know that this is normal from a healthy patient. And the doctor wants to compare the attention region of the 
uh, test image and the attention region, and the same region from the healthy uh, person's image. And we want to do the two sample test comparing uh, the difference between these two uh, attention regions. And uh, again, in this case, the above two shows the positive cases with the true brain tumor. So uh, our expected results would be a very small people because th these should be uh, statistically significantly different. So both the naive p-value and the selective p-value provide uh, 0. 0.000, meaning that those are true positive, all are fine. But if we go down to the bottom two cases, uh, that are negative cases without the brain, true brain tumors. And again, a naive p-value uh, that is obtained by forgetting the fact that uh, the attention regions are obtained by the deep neural network. Uh, it provides very small p-value, meaning that those are false positive. While selective p-value provides a greater p-value, meaning that this is true negative. So these are the results we will have by understanding the uh, topic, the talk I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so let me go into the detail of the uh, problem setup. The first is, is the segmentation. So it's uh, very simple. Our goal is to identify that uh, object region in a medical image by segmentation. We have uh, original image and the segmentation algorithm provided uh, object and background. So our model of the uh, image is something like this. So we have uh, obtained image X, and that can be considered as a random vector, uh, which is obtained by true vector, which we don't know, and some noise. And uh, now segmentation algorithm can be considered as a mapping from a random image to uh, pixels in object region and the pixels in background region. So now, uh, how we can uh, consider the statistical hypothesis testing problem for segmentation result? One way is to think uh, about this kind of null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. This is very simple. The null hypothesis is that the mean pixel value in the object is equal to the mean pixel value in the background. So this is a null hypothesis. And the alternative hypothesis is these are not are not equal. So in order to uh, provide the p-value for uh, this statistical hypothesis test, we can think about the test of statistic uh, difference of mean pixel values between object and the background region, uh, something like this. And then we can compute the statistical significance uh, by uh, pro computing the probability of observing more extreme uh, difference in the test of statistic rather than the uh, observed value. So this is the like a traditional two sample test between the object region, pixel values in the object region and the pixel values in the background region. Okay, so now uh, let me explain the problem uh, setup for the uh, explanation. So the goal is to identify the attention region in a medical image by a saliency method such as CAM or a GLAD CAM. Now, uh, given a trained neural net, a trained deep neural network, we have a test image X, and the test from the test image X, we will be able to obtain saliency region by CAM or GLAD CAM. And now uh, we are interested in whether this saliency region is something strange or not. And to do that, we're going to think about the reference image and pick up the same region as the uh, saliency region in the test image and compare these two. And in particular, we're going to do the two sample test between uh, this one and this one. So our model is uh, very similar to the previous uh, segmentation problem set up. We have a test image X, which is obtained by signal and noise. Signal, we don't know the truth. A uh, uh, signal is uh, something we don't know. And uh, also reference image uh, consists of the signal and the noise. And we're going to assume some noise distribution to uh, distribution to the noise in order to conduct the statistical inference later. Here, uh, we can think about the uh, saliency map method is an algorithm that maps an image X to uh, select the attention region, saliency region. 
MX here. So the statistical hypothesis testing formulation is also very similar to the case of segmentation. Now, our neural hypothesis is that the uh, signals in the uh, salience region is the same as the uh, signals in the same salience region from the reference images. So these are the this is the neural hypothesis, and the alternative hypothesis is these are not equal. So we can think about the test of statistics, something like this, and uh, we can compute the statistical significance by uh, p-value, uh, which is the probability of observing more extreme uh, difference between the uh, salience regions in the test image and the reference images than, that we observed. Okay, so uh, why these problems are difficult? So let's think about uh, uh, this problem as a huge scale multiple comparison uh, problem. Now we have uh, uh, two to uh, we have n pixels, n could be a very large number. But now uh, in the segmentation problem can be considered a problem to uh, assign uh, object or background to each of the uh, pixels. So that means that if we can, if we consider all possible segmentation results, then the result we have two to the power of number of pixels uh, segmentation uh, results. And uh, now deep neural network is trying to uh, find most likely segmentation result. That means that from uh, uh, two to the number of pixels uh, candidates of the segmentation result, uh, we can interpret that the deep uh, neural network uh, select the best one. So now uh, we can consider uh, this is a very huge scale multiple comparison problem. And uh, as you know, uh, when we compute a p-value in the case under the multiple comparison situation, we need to connect to the p-value. So correction of the selection bias is indispensable in this multiple comparison case. The situation is the same for the uh, explanation case. So we have two to the number of pixels possible results for the attention lesions by CAM or GLAD CAM. And now well-trained deep neural network is trying to select the most likely to be uh, most likely a, a lesion to to pay attention to. Uh, so therefore, it could be considered a multiple comparison problem for the candidate with uh, two to the number of pixels. So uh, some correction of the selection bias is needed for this multiple comparison issue. So if you hear the word multiple comparison, you might, uh, uh, for example, uh, start to think about, let's say, Bonferroni collection or something like this. And the traditional uh, multiple comparison uh, collection uh, can be done under the uh, framework of family-wise error rate control. So Bonferroni collection is one of such technique. And here in family-wise error rate control, uh, we, we want to control the probability of finding a, a false positive to be less than 0 0.05. And uh, in uh, another, in different cases where we have a huge number of, large number of hypotheses, sometimes false discovery rate is also used. And this is to control the expected proportion of discovery that are false to be less than the specified threshold alpha, such as 0 0.05. But now, I uh, remember that uh, uh, in our problem setups, we have two to the number of pixels of candidates. That's too huge to handle for those kind of family-wise error, family error rate control or false discovery rate control. So one nice approach that can be suitable for the case where we have two to the number of pixels uh, candidates is conditional selective inference. And this is uh, relatively newly uh discussing the literature and, uh, and the definition of conditional selective inf uh, in co conditional selective inference we want to control the probability of finding a false positive uh conditional on the hypothesis selection event to be less than alpha so this conditional on the hypothesis selection event is a very particular point of conditional selective inference 
Now, our idea is to uh, introduce conditional selective inference framework to the problem for deep neural networks. So now, uh, briefly explain, let me briefly explain what is conditional selective inference. So the key idea of conditional selective inference is to consider only the cases uh, where the same hypothesis is selected. Now, we have our observed data and deep neural network provide one particular hypothesis B. And when we make a statistical inference, we have a variety of uh, situation uh, in the parallel world, let's say. But in the uh, conditional selective inference, we only consider the case where the same hypothesis as the observed one is uh, obtained. Other case will be for, uh, not will not be considered as a uh, population. So intuitively, by considering only the randomness where the same hypothesis is selected, the hypothesis, hypothesis selection bias disappears. So this is the basic idea. So in another way, let's say this is a data space, a point indicates a data set, an image, and AI is a trained deep neural network. We observe the hypothesis to be a one segmentation result or a one attention map. Then uh, we might be able to have a different segmentation result or different attention maps. But uh, we can only think about the uh, subset of the data space where the same attention region or same segmentation result to be obtained and conduct a statistical inference under the, uh, and the restricted data space. Now, uh, our uh, selective p-value is defined something like this. This is the ordinal uh, p-value. And in the selective p-value, we have a conditioning part where the segmentation results are same as the one we observed. By computing this p-value, we can actually con uh, collect the bias of the, as, uh, obtained by deep neural networks. And the situation is same for the explanation. Uh, this is the ordinary p-value. Instead, in the selective p-value, we're going to think about the conditioning in the uh, only we consider the case where the same attention region is selected. So this provides uh, the uh, selective p bugs. So uh, this is uh, some comments about the ordinary p value versus selective p value. The ordinary p values are too complicated to compute for data driven hypothesis obtained by complicated algorithms such as the deep neural network. And the selective p values are computable as long as the selection event of the selected hypothesis are characterized in tractable way. So the key idea of conditional selective inference is to decouple the like, hypothesis selection part and the statistical inference part so that the latter can be done as if the hypothesis is fixed. By conditioning, we can fix the hypothesis. So now um, this is the main point of our uh, contribution. So how we can do the conditional selective inference for deep neural networks. And uh, uh, for segmentation, uh, it, it is typically we're going to use uh, something, the convolution neural network, something like this, which is called the unit because it has the U shape. And now our basic idea is to decompose the component of this unit. Uh, this is a CNN uh, to a piecewise linear component. Here now you see, uh, uh, sorry, this is not brain image, but the same. Uh, we can have, for example, uh, LELU and the convolution operation and max pooling, app sampling and thresholding, et cetera. And each of these uh, components can be represented by a piecewise linear uh, function. So this is our main point. So now uh, let's think about the uh, selection event for deep neural network. So uh, this is something we're going to consider. Uh, now, uh, the selective p-value is obtained by conditioning on the fact that the, the attention region are same as the uh, observed one. And also, we're going to uh, condition on the nuisance component. And then we can uh, actually compute the p-value. So that I don't really have the time to talk about the detail. But uh, anyway, by conditioning, we can have a selective p-value. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, characterizing with the selection event for uh, deep neural network uh, is very complicated. For example, uh, this is a data space and this is the direction of the test uh, statistics. And uh, this, the 
selection region. Uh, so that the same segmentation result is obtained or same attention region is obtained looks very complicated, something like this. So we introduce uh, so-called parametric programming idea to identify those regions in the direction of test of statistics. Although I don't really have uh, time to talk about the detail, we can compute one by one whether uh, each of the uh, segment uh, provides the same segmentation result or same attention map or not. And uh, computing the uh, conditional distribution by this. So now you can see that uh, each of the uh, component of the deep neural network could be actually represented by a very simple uh, function, in particular piecewise linear function. So therefore we could do something like uh, uh, parametric programming in the previous page. So now uh, this is, a, uh, I came back to the result which I already sh uh, showed to you uh, in the beginning of the presentation. By using selective p-value, we can also uh, provide a true negative result in the case where we don't actually have the true brain tumors. And this is uh, the result of the explanation. Okay, so this is my summary. So the reliability of data-driven hypothesis, the hypothesis obtained by the neural network should be properly evaluated, uh, can, could not be properly evaluated by traditional method. So selective inference is nice, one of the nice approach. And uh, we need some computational trick to apply selective inference to the deep neural network. And uh, actually we uh, did that for a set of problems. Thank you so much. Okay, so now let's try to advance my slides and see if it works. And I see that I do have a problem here. Just one second. Okay. Okay, so we want to quantify the probability of a uh, label prediction on a given test point, given uh, or on a given subpopulation, given the training sample. So you think of it as, say I'm, I'm training a, a automated car on recognizing uh, people on the street, but I trained it in, in Germany, and now the car is, I, I, I want to test it somewhere else, and I want to know, given that training data, on this particular image, how certain am I about the prediction? And that's different than what we usually do in uh, statistical machine learning because there's, we don't want something on the average. We don't want with probability over test points. I want to know how good I am on this test point. And it makes sense that depending on the relationship between your training data and the test point, you can have different levels of confidence. So we are trying to investigate this domain. Uh, and yeah, so standard, standard techniques for ensuring or measuring the quality of a learned predictor, they don't provide reliable and interpretable notions of confidence on a specific prediction. Okay, so I will, because of the, I, I will mainly what I'll do here is I'll describe to you the definitions that we need in order to discuss it, and then outline of our results. I will not get into anything, any uh, technical and, it is mainly a proof of concept saying that this direction is a possible direction, and I think that there's no doubt that it's an important direction. Okay, so um, we will consider that the point is that uh, we will need the definitions and we will need to consider prior assumptions. You cannot have any confidence or prediction without prior assumptions. Without prior assumptions, the next point is so you can assume. And we will kind of discuss three types of common prior assumptions, which are common in theory. And under each of them, we will see what can we get, what algorithms can be suitable for predicting confidence under these prior assumptions. And the three assumptions that we will consider are one of them is the Lipschitzness of the conditional labeling function. That is the probability of getting label one does not vary by much between close points. And the other assumption is that you have a hypothesis class that has low approximation error. Means you assume that one of the hypotheses in your class has low approximation error. And the last hypothesis that we investigate is the data generated by a mixture model, which is also a common hypothesis. And under each of these hypotheses, we are going to try to predict the confidence of a particular prediction, a particular test point 
under a particular sample that was used for training. Okay, so uh, some of my formal setup is completely standard. So we have a domain and I will assume here that our labels is a binary set zero or one and the data is generated by a probability over the X cross Y over uh, labeled points. And uh, we define this uh, conditional labeling function, which is the probability given X, what is the probability that Y will be labeled one, the label will be one given that X. And then we have the, the marginal distribution and the, okay, we have a hypothesis class and the usual zero one error for hypothesis. And the error of hypothesis class, the approximation error of hypothesis class is with respect to P is the error of the best hypothesis in this case. So all this is completely standard. Now I go to some definitions which are more specific to our work. So when you try to predict, to make confidence, what we're trying to consider here are label, what we call label coverage hypothesis. So what is label coverage hypothesis? When you need to predict the label of a point, you can either predict label zero or predict label one, or say, I don't know. The labels are either zero or one. When it's uh, when you we talk about um, the so we are going to talk about can coverage hypothesis. The hypothesis tells me how certain it is, and we want to know how much we trust this hypothesis. So a, a level, uh, what they call a, a label coverage learner, it takes a training data and it outputs such a hypothesis that either predicts values or predicts a, a set of values. If we are talking about real valued functions, then it is more interesting because in that case, we are predicting a range. So we take the training data and we predict a range in which we believe that the outcome will be. So here we have a, a, a CLF coverage learner, well, CLF is this uh, conditional label function, and it takes the input and it outputs a, a range on which the outputs would be. And we want to have an estimate of how certain we are that your next point, its label is in that range. Okay, so if we have such, if we have such a setup, we need to worry about two issues. One issue is the validity. So the validity is my, uh, I've output a coverage set and the coverage set is either binary or, or a, a, an interval of values. And I have a distribution and I see a sample. I want to know what is the probability that the true value falls in the coverage set that I predicted. So I want that this probability will be large enough. That will be my measure of confidence. What is the probability that the output value will fall inside my coverage set. In case of binary values, it is just what's the probability that I predicted the correct values because otherwise R is giving me nothing. So now we are learning slightly differently. We, are don't, we don't predict a label, we, need, we predict a range for the label and we want to uh, talk about our confidence that the label of the test point falls in that range. But validity is not enough because we can obtain validity trivially. If always I say I predict all of the range that I'm sure that I am valid. So we also have to add the criteria, which is which we call the other success criteria, which is called non-triviality. So we, we want to make sure that, uh, that we are not doing it trivially all the time. So let me go to the non-triviality. So a label coverage output is non-trivial. If it is a binary label, you're non-trivial if you predict a certain label, a specific label. If it is a conditional labeled function, then it is non-trivial if you predict the probability for y given one in a range which is smaller than one. So we have two criteria. We want to make sure that your label falls in the range that I predicted, and I want that often the range that predicted is not trivial. That's a non-triviality. Okay, so what I would like to uh, kind of 
jump right into is what can you do, how can you guarantee such confidence? So I will discuss how can you guarantee such confidence under each of those three uh, assumptions. So under the Lipschitz assumption, what we, the algorithm that we suggest is you divide your domain into cubes of some parameter that we will have to figure out how to fix. We divide your domain into cubes. And for every cube, you look at how many sample points fail there. You predict the probability of one in that cube to be the proportion of ones that you see in this cube. And then you estimate the confidence by how many sample points you had in this cube. So now we get a prediction of the label that depends on both the sample and the test point. Because I take the test point, I see which cube it fell in. And then I look at my training sample and I ask how many points in the training sample fell in that cube. And that kind of determines my confidence of um, the prediction that I gave for that point. And then we can, with this kind of, I mean, of course, we need to set uh, parameters correctly. and But with this algorithm, we can really prove that we get a validity guarantee, that if the data is generated by a distribution that satisfies lambda Lipschitz, lambda Lipschitz means that if you have two points uh, of distance d, then the difference between the probability of one in these two points is no more than lambda times d. So if you have a, 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 a you, your assumption is that your data is generated by a lambda Lipschitz labeling rule, then we can get kind of specific quantitative guarantees that gives us exactly the parameters. And I'm not getting it all into the calculations. I just want to give the flavor of things. So we have a, a guarantee of validity and we have a guarantee of non-triviality. And we, those guarantees depend on our choice of R and our uh, assumption about the Lipschitzness. So we get a validity guarantee. And similarly, we can prove a non-triviality guarantee. And again, I'm just, I just want to give the flavor of things. So we, we get training data. We output a predictor. And the predictor gives for every point a range. And we want that with high probability on the test point, we want to estimate the probability the test point label is indeed in that range. And we want to make sure that with high probability, our ranges are not trivial. And we can get those results with this kind of idea of algorithm of dividing the space when we assume that the data generating process is Lipschitz. So that's the first case of the, the Lipschitz assumption. But of course, there could be other assumptions, and we can also handle several other assumptions. So the next type of prior knowledge or assumption that we utilize is uh, the class approximation assumption. So what is the class approximation assumption? You assume that you have a concept class, a collection of models, and that you are certain that at least one of these models have low error. And the question is, under that assumption, what confidence can you give? So your assumption is just that one of your models has low error. And in that case, the algorithmic idea is that we fix, okay, again, we have a, a training sample and we have a test point. And we want to know how confident we are on the test point with this training sample. So what we are going to do is that we fix some, we pick some con, come accuracy level. And from all our hypothesis class, we only, we trim it down to just the hypothesis that have success empirical loss, which is better than this accuracy threshold. So we take the hypothesis space, we have the sample, we uh, keep only the hypothesis that are doing pretty well on the sample. Then among the hypothesis that are doing pretty well on the sample, we have a notion of decisiveness. What is the decisiveness? Decisiveness is you, uh, we have the test point, and now we have a collection of hypotheses that were picked by doing well on the sample. 
Now we can ask, what do they predict for the test point? And see how big is the majority? By how, what is the gap between the number of good hypotheses that predict zero and the number of good hypotheses that predict one? So this is the decisiveness of the hypothesis class based on the sample on this point. And based on those parameters, we can evaluate the confidence of predicting in this point. So here we get a guarantee that only depends on the assumption that among my models, we have one that predicts well, that predicts reasonably well. I mean, there are lots of parameters to set up in such an algorithm, depending on how good uh, my class is, I set up my threshold of what do I mean by good hypothesis, and then I set up what will be my prediction uh, on the points, when will I say I don't know, my prediction is either zero or one, and when will I give a prediction, and then I can get guarantees of confidence that it, the only assumption there is the assumption that the collection of hypotheses contain the good uh, hypotheses. Okay, so I will not go, I, I just deleted the, the uh, concrete uh, complicated functions of the guarantees that we get, but we get a guarantee for validity and we get a guarantee for non-triviality. These are the two measures that we want. Uh, so uh, the last kind of uh, assumption that we considered is that the data is, is uh, generated by a mixture model. So what do we mean by mixture model? We mean that we have a, the underlying distribution is say a mixture of Gaussian and each Gaussian has, generates one label. Each Gaussian is a label homogeneous. This is a, a common assumption in the model in which you view the labels as generating the data rather than the data is generating the labels. So I have the distribution of heights among uh, men in Israel, and I have a distribution of heights among uh, women in, in Angolia, and then, you know, I have a, collect, a mixture of Gaussians, and then I can, I have a point and I want to predict its height. So if we make such assumption about the degeneration, again, we are trying to come up with a predictor that will give us certain confidence based on the sample and the training data. So we use unlabeled data to approximate the maximum, the, the marginal data mixture. So we know that what we can learn mixture of Gaussians from unlabeled data, and we have exact bounds on how many samples needed to get confidence in that. And then we, now we have a mixture model for the unlabeled data for the marginal. Now we use the labels in the training sample in order to, define for each Gaussian what is its dominant label. And by the proportion of points that are labeled one in this, in this Gaussian, we can estimate the confidence that we have in the label of the Gaussian. And then for every point, we can look at the probability that it was generated by each of the Gaussians and based on this, give confidence to the uh, label that we give to the point. So again, we have a lot of parameters to set in such an algorithms and our quantitative results uh, look complicated, which I'm not listing, but again, we, we get results for the validity of this kind of algorithm and the non-triviality of this kind of algorithm, just based on the assumption that the data was generated by a mixture of um, Gaussians. They can either be in, in the vanilla case, each Gaussian is labeled homogeneous, but we can also handle situations in which the Gaussians have some a portion of a probability of ones and probability of zeros, and they are fixed for each of the Gaussians. Okay, so these are my results. Uh, this is kind of more of a direction that I want to move on to say that it's important to be able to predict the confidence in a given test point, given a given sample that was used for training. And uh, there are many uh, directions for further research. Uh, I think the most important research is, the two most important ones, is to extend this direction to other types of prior knowledge. We only considered three types of prior knowledge, deep of the labeling function, 
success or trust in the hypothesis and the mixture model that generates the data. And we also need to add a component that tell, kind of takes into account how confident you are in this prior assumption. Because here I assume that this prior assumption is just old. But the, my main message, I think the two points. One of them is that you can never be confident without making assumptions. So I want these assumptions to be explicit on the table and not implicit. And uh, the, the other uh, important thing is that confidence in prediction depends on the relationship between your sample and your test point. And it's not, in many cases, it's not enough to give a, an expected a, a confidence or expected error or probability of expected error being such and such. So I just want to call attention to this direction of research and I think there's a lot yet to be done and we kind of have a proof of concept. So thank you. Good morning and uh, good evening everyone. I'm Wei Huan, uh, working at Deep Learning Theory Team at Breaking IP. Today, I'm going to talk about explainable deep learning uh, from an over-parameterization perspective. So this is the outline of my talk. First, I will give an introduction, and then I will go to a specific uh, research topic. One is about the graph neural network, and another is about the deep active learning. So today people find that there is a fast growth in the deep learning model parameters. The left plot shows that uh, from AlexNet to ResNet and to VGGNet, the number of parameters in the new, net, new network is uh, increasing. And uh, the right plot shows that compared to GTP3, the GTP4 has much more parameters as one trillion. So how to understand the deep learning from the mean field theory perspective that in that way can let the number of the parameters, number of the neurons in the new network to be infinite. So the left plot shows that we can take the new network from a microscopic view that we can write down the uh, equation for the gradient flow for every parameters and it will get a large number of equations but these these equations are hard to solve and uh, untrackable on the other hand you, when we let the number of neurons to the infinite we can take the new network to a macroscopic view where you can study the coherence matrix of the hidden layers and uh, there is a theory called new tiny kernel theory that we can take the new network width to be infinite. And uh, in this case, we will have a trackable behavior of the new network. So let's consider a deep fully connected new network with L layers and we denote the output function as F. So we write down the gradient flow equation for the parameters and the output function. So the first uh, equation is about the evolution of the parameters uh, by the gradient flow function. Then we write down the uh, gradient flow function for the output function by plugging in the result of the first equation and the chain rule of the, then we define a new tiny kernel of the, for the new network. Basically, the new tiny kernel of this new network is a product between the derivative of the output function to its uh, parameters. And uh, if we want to observe how does the output function evolve during gradient flow based on this equation, but we have two problems. The first problem is that uh, as we, as the parameters are randomly initialized, uh, this kernel is stochastic. And the second problem is that the new tiny kernel is changing during time. So it's hard to uh, track the equation based on a stochastic and uh, changing kernel. Then fortunately, 
people find that in the infinite with limit, the kernel have uh, like uh, very good properties. The first is that at initialization, this kernel is deterministic instead of stochastic. And the second is that during gradient flow training, this kernel is does not change. Then we can plug in uh, this result into the dynamics equation for the ARPU function. And we find that this equation is easier to, to solve. But we can further assume that the loss of this uh, problem is a um, mean squared error loss, then the result is here. So this is a linear ordinary differential equation. And uh, we provide the solution of this linear ordinary differential equation. And we find that this equation can tell us uh, more about how does the upper function in the new network evolve. And if we look at the, this equation, we can find that let us that, uh, let the t to be infinite, then this term will be zero. And uh, this term will also be zero. Then, then you, you find that at the, at, the, at the time of convergence, f uh, is equal to y, which is the ground truth of the model. Then you find the training loss is uh, zero, exact, exactly uh, zero which means that you can find the global minimum of the neural network by gradient flow. And this is one of the most impo uh, important results from the Newtonian kernel theory. Now let's come to the two specific research uh, topics. Uh, I'm going to use the Newtonian kernel to study the problem in the deep learning and try to uh, design a like, practical algorithm to solve the problem. So the first uh, is about the graph neural network. Here, I show the basic structure of a graph neural network. We define the number of the units as the depth of the graph neural network. So in each propagation unit, there are two uh, operations. The first is the aggregation operation, which aggregates the information from neighborhoods to its central node, then followed by a MLP. And uh, about the graph neural network, people find that the most graph neural network can achieve their best performance at a shallow depth, for example, two or three layers. And uh, this plot shows that on three node classification tasks, the graph new, the accuracy of train and the test accuracy of the graph neural network will decrease as you increase the depth of the graph neural network. And this phenomenon inspire us to ask questions. Why the deep, for, for graph neural network, the, when, when the depth of the network comes deep, uh, it, it cannot train and uh, even fail to generalize and uh, we are thus inspired to use the new tiny kernel theory to study this problem. And uh, we first ask, can we design an algorithm to deepen this graph new network? The answer is yes. So as, as I introduced before, the, train, the training process of the infinitely wide new network is governed by new tiny kernel. Um, for a graph neural network, we can also let the width of the, this graph neural network to be infinite. And then we term the, this tiny kernel for graph neural network as GNTK. And it can measure how, whether the graph neural network is trainable. Then we characterize the behavior of the GNTK as the depth goes to infinite. So to be specific, in a graph neural network, there are two propagation equations. The first equation one is about the uh, aggregation oper uh, operation, which aggregates the hidden representation from neighborhood to its central node, and uh, followed by an MLP, which is a, a nonlinear transformation of the uh, representation. So correspond to the two operations, there are two formulas that for GNTK, 
So the equation three is about the GNDK uh, correspond to the aggregation operation. The, sec the first equation uh, correspond to the nonlinear transformation, which is, uh, which is the MLP in the graph neural network. So by propagating this equation two and three recursively, we can obtain the final neural tiny kernel for graph neural network. And uh, we theoretically show that this GNDK will converge exponentially to a singular matrix because the GNDK is a matrix. Uh, here, mu and mu prime is a node index in a graph neural network, in a graph data. And we find that this GNDK matrix converts to a singular matrix in an exponential rate. And uh, the reason behind this exponential decays is the uh, aggregation operation, which corresponds to a transition matrix. And we further use this result to characterize the to characterize the training error of the, this graph neural network. We find that in the large depth, uh, the the GNDK is a singular matrix. Then this training error is larger than our constant, which means that deep graph neural network cannot be trained successfully. And people, one may ask, in, in the computer vision, there is a rest net that can deepen a uh, new network. Uh, does, does it also work on graph neural network? We also, uh, based on this question, we also apply our theoretical framework to study uh, the residual connection in graph neural network. Uh, we, our result is that the residual connection in graph neural network can indeed slow down the convergence rate, but it still suffer from an uh, exponential decay. We did here we did the experiment to verify our to verify our theory. The the first uh, three part is about the GNDK matrix. So the first is the part A is about GNDK for vanilla GNN without residual connection. The, the second part B is about the residual connection during, uh, between the aggregation operation. And the uh, part C shows the residual connection between MLP. And uh, we find that, that all of these GNDK has a exponential decay, uh, except that the residual connection between aggregation has a, uh, has a slow, slow decay rate, but it's still an uh, exponential decay. So we then come to the second research question. Can we design an algorithm that can solve this problem? Uh, the answer is yes. And during the theoretical analysis, we find that the aggregation, aggregation uh, operation correspond to a transition matrix. And then it can like lead to the exponential decay. So we can we like break up this, uh, break this condition to, to further solve this problem, then we proposed a critical drop edge algorithm. Basically, it drops the graph, the edge in the graph randomly. And uh, we is we also inspired by the by statistical physics that there is a theory called population theory states that there is a critical drop rate that can let the random graph to have a a uh, critical phenomenon where the information transition in this graph has a polynomial rate instead of an exponential rate. And uh, we and uh, we given this result, we design our algorithm that we can directly characterize uh, cal calculate the drop rate of the graph new network. And uh, that's what we call the our algorithm as critical drop edge. So the result shows that compared to other methods such as drop edge, um, which does not have a like critical drop rate. And the DGN is a normalization based uh, method. Our method, our this drop edge method can uh, outperform these uh, baselines. And also, as you can see, as we increase the depth of the graph neural network, our results, our method can achieve like comparable Result in even in the deep graph neural network, and we also further uh, examine the, if the this critical drop date is close to optimal or even optimal. 
then we find that uh, this this black prob uh, probability is our critical drop aid, and we find that in three uh, in three uh, node classification tasks, it's indeed close to optimal. And now it's come to the second research problem. It's about the deep active learning. So we know that for deep learning models, usually require a large number of high quality label data, uh, which is time consuming and expensive. So a promising approach to solve this problem is that we put the human in the loop, in the loop which is called active learning. First, uh, we train the model by given data set, by given label, which may be a uh, very small, uh, a small number of uh, label data. Then the algorithm, the algorithm will decide, um, uh, query the unlabeled data. And uh, then people, experts will, will know, know this data uh, by, uh, to answer the query by the algorithm. Then after we obtained the query, uh, label data, we put uh, this label data into the training set. We keep training and uh, in using this loop. So can we like study uh, how to improve the active learning algorithm? So can, uh, classical view from the statistical learning setting can give answer. Uh, some such as uh, from VC, di VC dimension theory. However, this kind of theoretical analysis uh, may not hold for over parameterized uh, deep new networks. So, inspired by this observation, we are we are uh, going to use the new tiny kernel framework to study the properties of the optimization and generalization of deep new networks and try to. Uh, inspired from the of the theoretical observation to design an algorithm to uh, give to get a better deep active learning algorithm. So, uh, based on NTK framework, we will we find that the deep neural network has a, a rule which is called train faster than generalize better. So. This theory give a convergence rate of the loss for the deep graph neural network characterized by the new tiny kernel. And uh, basically here is the eigen decomposition of the new tiny kernel. And uh, we, we, we find by observing this convergence rate, we find that we can design, uh, we, we can define a concept called alignment which is a kernel alignment between the new tiny kernel and the label of the uh, data set. And we call it alignment. And we find that this alignment is negatively correlated with the uh, with, with training error of the new network during, during training. And so we first uh, can connect the alignment between, uh, connect the alignment with the uh, uh, training process. Then there is a theory states that the the generalization bound of the deep uh, over parameterized network can can be characterized by the uh, uh, alignment between the inverse of the new tiny kernel with their uh, labels, and uh, we then connect our ali proposed alignment with the generalization bound. Uh, we find that theoretically this, this generalization bound is negatively correlated with uh, our designed uh, alignment. So multiply this, uh, so this uh, by using the alignment, uh, by using alignment, we connect the training process and the generalization property of a uh, parameterized uh, deep uh, neural network. And we find that they are like uh, negatively correlated. Uh, or, or we can state that if the new network has a faster training training rate, then it uh, with a high probability it can generalize better. Then, in spite of this observation, we we tried we we design an algorithm 
which we try to maximize the alignment of a new network and to select to select the uh, the labels that we are want to query in the active learning and uh, the we did an experiment to verify our proposed uh, algorithm and we find that our algorithm can outperform other uh, state of our baselines and uh, this plot shows the, our result in three different uh, data set with different new new network and uh, so this concludes my presentation and uh, thank you for your attention okay so um thank you everyone uh for having me there and uh, my name is of course Amir Masood Farahmand and I'm going to talk about uh, some ideas about how we might accelerate uh, reinforcement learning algorithms and planning algorithms. At a very high level the idea here is uh, we found some interesting connections between planning and RL and some other areas of applied math maybe we can say uh, including control theory and also numerical uh, linear algebra that allows us to uh, design uh, kind of new algorithms with some interesting properties. So uh, here the idea is that, uh, so we have this reinforcement learn, we have this agent that is interacting with, some, uh, with the board and uh, it is basically observing the state of the board, choosing its action, using some policy, and as a result, it uh, gets to a new state x at time t, t, uh, t plus one, and also receives a reward. And the goal here is, of course, uh, figure out how this agent should choose its action, basically what the policy should be, in order to get as much reward as possible. So here, uh, the, the exact formalism may not be very important. What is important is that I use p to denote the transition probability of the agents. So uh, one important concept in reinforcement learning is the concept of uh, value function, which is basically saying how much uh, reward in average the agent is receiving. Here I'm talking about uh, the, dis uh, the discounted sum of rewards, which as you see is a summation of rewards that is multiplied this, by this uh, discount factor gamma to the power of t. So discount factor determines how important it is for the agent to receive the reward uh, in the far future or in the near future. So if the discount is close to zero, uh, the reward that is received in the far in the future is not very important for the agent. Uh, but uh, when gamma is close to one, like 0.99, for instance, it means that the reward in the far future is also important. And in many applications, we care about when discount factor is actually close to uh, a large uh, number of one. So uh, value function uh, is by value function. So we, here I define the value function for a policy. We can define a value function. Uh, so the value function uh, of the optimal policy are denoted by V star. So value function is important because uh, many reinforcement learning algorithms uh, estimate or approximate value function as an intermediate step to get to the optimal uh, policy. So the question becomes, how can we compute this value function? Uh, one fundamental algorithm for doing this is called value iteration, and it's a basis of many other algorithms in reinforcement learning, uh, such as temporal difference learning, Q learning, and also fitted Q iteration, deep Q network. All of them are some version, approximate version of this value iteration. So a uh, value iteration uh, basically is an iterative procedure that gets some value functions, current estimate of value function VK, applies uh, applies the so-called a Bellman operator to it in order to obtain the new value function. So what is the Bellman operator? Bellman operator is this operator that takes a function v and adds a reward and returns another function. And this new function is uh, basically the reward plus discount factor times expectation of the value function at the next states. So 
uh, this is the Bellman operator. We apply the Bellman operator to our value function. We get another value function, VK plus one. We do it again, we get VK plus two, VK plus three. And interesting uh, and important property of this value iteration is that if we do this infinite times, it is guaranteed to converge uh, to the true value function. So this is all great. We, uh, this is convergent procedure and many RL algorithms can be built on top of this. But there is an issue. And the issue is that value, uh, value iteration can be slow. As I mentioned earlier, uh, in many applications, uh, we want a, a discount factor to be a large number. Uh, but if the discount factor is large number, value iterations, convergence rate, which is order of comma to the power of k, is going to become uh, very slow. So for instance, if comma is 0.99, we need about 70 iterations in order to get uh, to uh, make the initial error uh, to half, and about 700 to get the order of 10 to the power of minus 3. So this is uh, so many iterations. and uh, makes the whole procedure slow. The question here that I want to address in this talk is that whether we can do anything uh, about this and make design algorithms that are somehow faster. So I suggest two, pro uh, two proposals. Uh, one is uh, called PID value iteration. It's based on making connections between uh, planning algorithms and control theory, dynamical systems and control theory. And the other one, which is called operator splitting value iteration, makes connection between uh, planning algorithm and as, uh, methods for solving linear systems of equations. So um, PID value iteration. So this is, a, this is based on a paper uh, at ICML 2021. So uh, the key point here is that we can see value iteration as a dynamical system. So why? Let me explain. So uh, I just write value iteration, VK plus one is the Bellman operator applied to VK, which if uh, we expand, we get reward plus gamma times P pi VK. So this kind of matrix vector multiplication or matrix notation for uh, that expectation that I showed before, or integral that I showed before. This can be written as, with some manipulation, as VK plus UK, and UK is, uh, essentially uh, the error that we have between EK, between the current estimate of value function and the true value. So VK minus V pi is the error. We do some manipulation of it and we get this UK uh, vector and we just add that UK to it. So this can be seen as a, close, as a particular choice of closed loop control system where uh, we have a reference signal in the language of control engineering and control theory. We have a reference signal V pi. Our current output is VK. Uh, through a feedback loop, uh, we compare VK and V pi, generates an error signal EK, and then through some, uh, going through a computer, uh, some controller, we get UK. And then UK goes to uh, the so-called plant, which in this case is just a simple integrator or a simple summation operator. So this, we just compute the summations of all these UKs and uh, which are based on the error that we have. Of course, in practice, we don't have V pi. Uh, we don't, we want to compute V pi, uh, but that doesn't matter. It just shows that this diagram shows that what value iteration is doing effectively is computing this uh, solving, trying to uh, get a VK through feedback loop uh, to be close to V pi. So this is an example of a uh, very simple controller called, called proportional controller, where uh, proportional controller is taking the control signal and multiply it by some kappa P. So uh, if you compare this more general form of proportional controller with what I have here as the value iteration, we see that if we choose kappa p equal to one, we get the conventional uh, value iteration. And if we have kappa p different number, it would be a bit slightly more general framework than uh, value iteration. So now the question is that 
can we use other controllers to modify and accelerate this dynamics? Uh, proportional control is the most simple type of controller. We have this arsenal of control, um, control methods control, or controller design methods and control engineering, and control theory. Can we use them in order to accelerate? As just a proof of concept that it is possible, I use uh, something that is called proportional integral derivative or PID controllers. These are controllers that are commonly used in industries like controlling uh, chemical factories and cars and things like that. Here, I want to use them to design algorithms, planning algorithms. So let's, uh, I want to describe the element of this, uh, uh, this PID controller by going through each of the new elements. So the P is already there, more or less. So the derivative term is computing the derivative of the value function, uh, which here would be the difference between VK and VK minus one. Uh, this is of course a fine, uh, the discrete time derivative, so it would be the difference. And the interpretation of this is that uh, this D term is computing the trend or the linear trend of value functions. So if we see that the value functions across iterations are just gradually increasing, we simply uh, compute this uh, trend and try to extrapolate based on that. So this is what uh, the D term, derivative term is doing. Integral term introduces a new variable, so Z, which is just a, a smooth version of uh, something that is called Bellman residual. It's a one kind of notion of how far we are from the correct solution. So it, we compute that Z and then we just add this Z term uh, to the estimate of value function. So the interpretation of this is that it is performing some form of low pass filtering on the Bellman residuals. And if you put all these things together, we get just PID value iteration, which has this uh, formula. And if you want to visualize it in the form of feedback control loop, it looks like what I had before. Uh, but instead of just one type of controller, we have three types. So uh, this path in the controller was what we had before, but now we have two other paths, this one and also this one. So this is the integrator term and this is the derivative term that are added. And the idea is that if we can find uh, these parameters of these controllers, or as control engineers would say, called gains, controller gains, kappa P, kappa I, and kappa D, we can potentially change the behavior of this dynamics and make it potentially faster. So I just want to show you how it may look like. Uh, so uh, here I'm showing on a very simple domain. Uh, like a chain work much, much simpler than what uh, Jeff presented. Uh, but, and here on the x-axis, I'm showing the iteration number of this new procedures of PID value iteration. And then y-axis is the difference between VK and V star. And it is note that it's in the logarithmic scale. So here, uh, the conventional value iteration is this curve. And you see that it has a kind of goes, uh, goes to zero, but with a relatively slow rate. And these other parameters or these other curves are for different choices of parameters of that controller. And you see that for some of them, the, uh, the acceleration, the rate would be much, much faster. So for instance, uh, here after 500 iteration, value iteration, the error becomes about maybe around a bit smaller than 1.5 maybe. But here, if we choose the right parameter, there is about 10 to the power of minus five. So this is a much faster uh, process. So, um, so this is a one approach, bringing tools from control theory to design faster planning algorithm. This other paper is about uh, another set of ideas here now from numerical uh, linear algebra. So this is operator splitting value iteration. And this is a, a joint work with uh, my PhD student, Amin Raksha, and also uh, undergrad researcher, Andrew Wang, and Mohammad Ravonzada, who is a researcher at Google. So this was published in Europe. 
So here, the setup is a slightly different. The setup here is that we have two models. Uh, one is a true dynamics, uh, and the other is an approximate model P hat. The true dynamics, we assume that it is, uh, well, of course, accurate, true, but it's very expensive to query. And then P hat is very cheap. We assume that it is, there's no cost in querying it, but it has some error. And now we want to use these two models in order to compute uh, our value functions. Uh, so uh, what are possible applications, uh, or at least high level applications of this uh, scenario that we have two models? One is that we have, when we have model-based reinforcement learning algorithms or agents, this agent interacts with the world. It collects samples, but samples can be very expensive. For instance, in the, it might be samples from healthcare, which each data point is some maybe experiment or test on a patient. So it is not easy to collect. But, but also this model-based RL agent can use these uh, samples to create, a, to learn a model of how the world works. So this is basically a world model. And because it is learning it, there's always some error in it. So it is not a perfect model. The environment is costly, but learn model is basically the cost is only computational cost. It's like GPU or CPU cost. So that's, we don't consider as the real cost. So this is one case, model-based RL. The other case is that uh, in some problems, maybe robotics and also uh, some other domains, we might have uh, simulators of different fidelity. We might have a very accurate simulator, uh, which is very slow in computation. And we have very approximate uh, simulators that ignore many of the, the uh, physical uh, phenomena, but provides kind of roughly how the, uh, the, what we are simulating, for instance, the robot works. So this would be another case that it's not model-based RL, but it's more planning with different, high, different fidelity uh, models. So usually, how, to, how can now we use these models? Uh, there are two approaches here most people do. Either they use the, the true P, ignore P hat. The downside, the good thing about it is that it is asymptotically accurate. They find the right solution eventually, but it, is, uh, it requires a lot of queries to P. And remember that the rate of, say, value iteration was gamma to the power of K. So it means we need a lot of some, uh, interactions with P. The other is that uh, we use the model, and this is mostly what we do in model-based RL. We just rely on the model and hope that the model is accurate. This the great thing about is that there's no uh, query cost to p hat, but the bad thing is that uh, it is it leads to an incorrect solution. And how incorrect it is depends on how close p hat to p is. So there is a lot of effort on how to learn better models, more accurate uh, p hats, but still there would be uh, some error at the end of the day. So the question that I want to ask in this part is that whether it's possible to use both models without the cons, but with their pros. So this sounds like too good to be true, uh, but let me, uh, let me show you how we can do it. To explain it, I need to give a detour on uh, numerical linear algebra and the problem of solving a linear systems of equation. So suppose we have a matrix A, uh, which is known and vector B, and we want to find vector X that solves this uh, equation. There are a lot of methods people have studied for centuries, uh, but one class of methods are uh, based on splitting matrix A to two matrices, matrix M and matrix M. So this mat these are called matrix splitting methods. And then after splitting it, uh, we iteratively find X by computing X K plus one as inverse of M times B plus N times X K. And if we choose M and N in a careful way, we might uh, come up with a procedure that has a good convergence behavior. The rate usually depends on the choice of M and N. And uh, if you haven't had matrix splitting, uh, I'm sure you have heard like Jacob method or Gauss Seidel. These are some examples of uh, matrix splitting methods with different choices of M and N. So why is it relevant? 
The reason it's relevant is that a vector a value iteration is actually one example of matrix split. To see why, consider the Bellman equation, which describes uh, some consistency property of value function, which says that matrix I minus gamma P times vector V is equal to vector R. So if you find a vector V that satisfies this equation, then that would be the value function for policy pi. And if we split this matrix to two matrices pi and gamma P pi, it gets the same formula or form as the matrix splitting type of matrix. And in fact, it is easy to, I mean, we clearly see here that if we uh, follow the recipe of matrix splitting, VK plus one becomes inverse of identity matrix, which is identity times reward plus gamma P pi VK. So, and this is the value iteration method, the conventional value iteration. Now the question is that, can we come up with a splitting uh, that is maybe a bit smarter than this and lead, that leads to an acceleration? So there are several possibilities, but one possibility that I want to talk about is, and I call uh, operator splitting value iteration, is by bringing that approximate model that I talked a few minutes ago, P hat, into the picture. So uh, we split I minus gamma P to I minus gamma P hat minus gamma P minus gamma P hat. So I just add and subtracted the same P hat matrix there. And then following the recipe of matrix splitting, this leads to uh, VK plus one to being equal to I minus gamma P hat inverse times reward plus gamma P pi minus uh, P hat of VK. So this is actually has an interesting interpretation. The interpretation is that at each iteration of uh, this operator splitting value iteration, we are solving an auxiliary MDP where the dynamics is P hat, so approximate model, but the reward has uh, two components. One is the original reward, but the other is this correction, error correction terms that is basically saying that uh, how much the prediction of uh, PVK is different from the prediction of P hat VK. So at each iteration, we we need to query P to compute this PBK and then compute the difference between these two terms and add it to the, uh, uh, the reward function. What solves the MDP using P hat? And if we do this procedure, we can show that it has nice properties. So for instance, we can sh uh, show that the difference between VK and V pi is upper bounded by order of gamma prime to the power of K. Uh, and gamma prime has this form of this is uh, some function of gamma times the difference between P and P hat. So this is the error in our model that is multiplied by some constant. This can be, uh, this gamma prime, if it is smaller than gamma, this leads to a much faster convergence rate. And the interesting thing here is that this basically says that if the model error is small enough, we get a good convergence behavior. And the other property is that if the model is inaccurate model, even if you use inaccurate model, uh, it does not lead to an incorrect solution. And just as an example of how it looks like, uh, consider I'm showing you uh, the planning problem, there's iteration, and this is value error, uh, this is value iteration, and this is operator splitting value iteration, which has much faster rate. And we can do the same thing. Uh, we use this idea of operator splitting value iteration, design a reinforcement learning algorithm from it. We call it operator splitting Dyna. And uh, here I'm comparing it with model free approach, Q learning, um, a model based approach, purely model based approach, Dyna, and operator split. So here, this figure higher is better. And you see that model three one is great. It has synthetic conversion of two policies through va good value, but it is slow. Uh, and the model based one uh, is does not converge that. But here, Oysteiner converges has converges fast to a good value. So just to summarize, uh, 
So there are two take home messages. One take home message is that we can interpret planning algorithms such as value iterations, dynamic cost system, and use control theory to modify their behavior. The second take home message is that we are not uh, limited to either use the inaccurate model or the accurate model. Uh, this operator splitting procedure allows us to uh, design new class of planning and RL algorithms that benefit from both. Uh, and I think that, that's all. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. So this is Ling from Rikian AIP. So basically, what I want to discuss is about how to address practical challenges in the artificial intelligence from medical domain and general tasks. In order to let you know me, let me briefly introduce myself. So my background is quite different, like because my background actually was liberal education. So at that time, I learned a lot of like useless things like Latin, the training of therapist, but never used them. Again, so then I was in PAU to my PhD, and then in A star doing the, in the, then I was did my PhD in AU. At the AU is a very nice experience because I was at that time I was like the, also doing the TA at the Croft School of Public Policy. So my students and friends are now working in different organizations like UN, WTO. So they they keep on asking me one simple question, like from MDGS to SDGS like 10 years has passed, regardless of like technical technic details, what AI has really contributed for our human well-being? So I think, I hope that today I can answer this question. I can partially answer this question. So basically, like then I was did my postdoc at ASTAR, like the AI as an NII and it's Kyoto University for the like the participating uh, cabinet office project. And now I'm very lucky to be in Rikian AIP on the machine intelligence for medical engineering team. So there are three research directions. One is on the medical research, like the uh, FMI, tumor, breast cancer, and the, a lot of things, and also the cardiology and the things. The second one is on the uh, called Mushal project. So this is a project led by Kevin of Japan. We hope to hu free human beings from late limitation by 2050. It's a very long time thing. And the third one is what, the one I'm particularly interested in because I'm now in charge of the joint grant between Reiki and Georgia University on subtyping schizophrenia with AI. So finally I can use my like the license as a therapist. So, but before the talk, I want to like the show. I I want to, yeah. I I want to say a very interesting thing. I, I want to share you a very short story, like about why I think that it is important to merge the different fields together to solve the real challenge. So, like in Japan, they have the they also have the same word like this one to say combining strength and expertise from different fields can be very powerful. So today I, I just want to share a very short story. I just learned this days. So now we're working with actuaries of airlines and Zurich Financial Service Australia, which is two, which are two leading insurance companies in Australia. We're building a causal or reasoning insurance pricing model, especially on COVID-19. So this work will be present in the ICA, which is like the top conference I think more than conference, the Congress for the International Auctioning Association every four years, like the Olympic Games. So they will make the actuary practice and then do, do a lot of discussion there. The very interesting thing is like this. So my like I just think so my colleagues, I'm instructing them to apply the causal model to discover the causal factors behind the more mortality. But unfortunately, I couldn't touch the data. So they just attack, do all the things like I gave them the model. They do the things and we just have feedback to make sure the data is isolated. Then they find a very strong causal relation, but they don't like they're not sure. Like, yeah, so I really hope to say this story in the in, in real because then I can see your face to see whether you're also shocked or not. But if you like, maybe you can just raise your hand or use other way to show that you're shocked or not. They find the mental illness will increase the mortality. They find there is a causal relation between the mental illness and the mortality. 
I don't know how would you think, but for me, this is really shocked because in our psychiatrists, like the, this relation, relations are so well studied. Like, for example, the life, I can immediately tell life expectancy among those like severe mental illness is like 10 years or 20 years shorter than general population. We have huge, a lot of research. But the insurance company simply didn't know that. That's why they do not rate on the mental illness history. So I want to say like from here, it tells us like the common sense in one field is precious to others. So this is the first, first story I want to share, the very star, first star, like the story I want to share you. So finally, I, I know that like the, our human welfare are not protected by, I, at first I saw that the insurance companies may not read on the mental illness because the law or other, but now I know it's protected by their ignorance rather than their conscious, which I strongly doubt whether they have. Okay, thanks to the multiple disciplinary collaboration, like in last year, we have uh, like a triple AI, ECCV, and also later methods. And then like my research team is like this. So with the word artificial is introduced in English from artificial layers in 15th century. So made wings that are made by humans, like as like the way discussed today, there are so much efforts on how to make AI. But the problem is how to make the AI for human being in the real world. What is the bottleneck? So I think that this is a bottleneck I would like to rather identify. It's like this. All happy families are alike, which means the existing computer vision and machine learning algorithm perform well on the ideal conditions and parameters. But each unhappy family is unhappy it's in its own way. When you apply to the real case, then you will encounter like so many different, like say the situations and difference, like the totally different from other people. So like the, that's why their accuracy and effectiveness always decrease like in the real world scenario. So I think that the key research, the key is to identify this gap between ideal and real. And just like the title of our book will be released in June, we call this book has a, like the subtitle called A Practical Guidance for AI Application. This is what I want to talk today. So let's, let me go to the uh, research, medical research at first. I think the gap between the engineering professionals and medical experts are actually about the ground truth. Because for like engineering people, we like the well-defined, simple, elegant, like ground truth label. But in medical, it is like always, we are always dealing, dealing with imperfect, uncertainty, ambitious, real things. That's why actually like we have us, we, our slogan is like this, to cure sometimes, to relieve often, and to comfort always, which means that we can only cure in, not, not we can cure only sometimes. So we are full of the uh, medical world is full of uncertainty and imperfectly. For example, in this report, you can see it keeps on writing as uh, the most likely and then the probably questionable, full of these things. So I want to like summarize this, like the, I like, especially I want to summarize like this thing. We can call it, we're in the medical, we're not God. We're only symptom, which means that most of the time, we don't know the ground truth. Like, for example, in the medical practice, they do it in this way. First of all, they use the observation and to give a label. But be careful, this label is not really the cause of the disease. Sometimes it doesn't, it's just a means of description rather than a real meaning. And then even we sometimes we give after we give the label, its effect is also not known, for example, in the breast cancer, it's very common to say, okay, it's like you only have 10%, over 10% or 50% likelihood of malignance. And this uncertainty is like the best uncertainty we are known. We know, actually, for most of the time, so we, when we, whenever we gave a label, it doesn't mean anything, actually. And the final thing is like that, after doing the things, the doc, doctor make a lot of decision, not for any reason. For example, this is like the radiotherapy. The red part is the tumor our eye can see. So definitely it means that we have to give very high radiation. But the problem is because we know the tumor will like secretly invade the other organs. So we also have to give the green part, which means that we have to, 
we, we have to give the green part, which like to give a margin to also give the radiation. But the problem is like that, for it's not seen by our human eye. Like in the surgery, people can only do it like in that. It's like when we do the cutting, we will just dig some things to the bicep to see like whether that there is tumor or not. But when doing that, but this is after the surgery. So, so basically, the doctor can just make this margin like the by quite arbitrary. So, if it is too small, then some tumor can, breast the cancer can, the cancer tumor cells can escape. Then, the, the treatment is nonsense. But if it is too small, it is too wide, then it will hurt other people for part. For example, it will in the breast, it will hurt the talk, it will give the toxin to the heart, and it will it will give the toxin to the heart. So. As a final result, it's like that. So the doctor is actually gave this mark, determining this margin quite arbitrarily. And the final, re the final result can be only known after several years. So I think that I want to say this, what I want to say is like, the final result is, the final consequence is, the AI professionals will keep on asking for ground truth label, but, for doctors, there's no ground truth label most, for most of the time. So they will just say, okay, well, I will give you, then please simulate my intimate or simulate just the, like the match this one or regress to this label. But actually this label are not a real label understand by our machine learning people. So like, I really hope to have more collaboration, like saying, uh, like for example, how can we define uncertainty in machine learning? and how to reflect this description in causal relation. Here is like some of our like solution. The first solution is tr we try to make the, to um, make the uh, open the mutual deepen the mutual understanding between two fields like the to participate the real diagnosis of the, the real diagnosis loop. For example, one of our research is like uh, um, is to try to uh, like that to do the interpretation, but the details is too like that. I don't want to waste you on these details, but I just want to say we just make a double blind test on licensed like doctors, which means that for example, we just generate the images and the medical images and then mix them with the real images and then send it to the doctor and let them to decide like the, make the diagnosis. And we say find that our simulated the doctor medical images is actually they can also do the diagnosis and in accordance with our prediction. So they really enjoy this like double blind test. And also, I just also just want to I change the title just from like I have just heard. If you don't know, don't know what to do, just intimate human. So we just intimate human gaze to help the like to help the our medical research. For example, we use the, like the in the attention model. We just use let the human gaze to let the attention model to simulate the human gaze and. It's worked quite well. In, for this direction, we even developed our own gaze tracking hardware, which is more cheaper. And we can also like collect the physiological single collection. And like the, this one, I want to recommend you because I think may, maybe some of you may be interested in, may be interested in. So this is our paper published in ECCV and we released the world's largest human gaze data set on the CUB, on the CUB. So basically what we are finding is like that the human gaze will change when people are doing different recognition tasks. For example, telling this bird is from which order or which family or which genesis. So I think this data set is, will be very useful for both AI research and uh, congregation like research. So we are also doing support like the surgery and the things, but never mind, it's like uh, things. So another, then I want to shift to the gap in the computer vision. So like our computer vision, is, uh, most of the algorithm are designed on the good like the settings, like the proper, proper nice one, but we will find it will fail in the low light condition, overexposed haze and raining things. So how shall we deal with it? The very first, very first solution is like we're directly developing a terahertz imaging. So this, this new imaging system are very robust to all this like the things. So this is one solution. 
And the other solution, then, then the other solution is to we try to like the use the normal image to, to try to do the detection and segmentation on the normal image, uh, but to make it very robust. So how do we do that? We propose a concept called the perceptual constant representation. So basically, what we are doing is like that because like the deep learning because we know that most of the like neural networks work in the encoder decoder way. So in the encoder way, it's actually will project the, all the images into a feature. So we, if this feature is perceptual constant, for example, it's in, invariant to elimination or invariant to the size, then it can, will be makes our the algorithm itself be robust to, to all the to this like challenging conditions. So for example, in here, we borrow the idea, we use the, or we also use the self-supervised learning to help us. The idea is like very simple. Uh, the idea is very simple. Like for example, we have a one, we, whenever we have a normal image, then we transfer them into the dark image and then project it and then project it into the and put it into during the and put it in the training. And during the training is then it will we can get its encoded features. But then we, we have to say, okay, in this encoded features, you have to tell me like the what's the difference between like the the bright one and the dark one. For example, uh what transformer transformation it has gone, like how what kind of noise you have added or like the how darkness it, it is. So Finally, and then the very cool thing is like that, according to a theory called the AET autoencoding transformation, if we, can, if we can decode this like transformations, this means that this manifold itself will be, this manifold itself will be invariant to all the like the transformations. It's a very cool idea, but it's a very cool like the theory behind it, but it works quite well. So basically with this idea, then we find that our method we can, Directly enhance that we use this strategy to do it, introduce a small self supervised learning strategy into the existing method. And we find that it can detect the object in dark very well. So here is a takeaway tips. So, but in here, we, our success, another, our success is actually partially like, also partially lies in the practical physical model because maybe to worse it is very surprising to a lot of you a lot of you photo does not directly reflect the physical world actually like the whenever we collect the image then we, we take a photo then the, it will go through a lot of dsp and all the like the signal processing on bec before becoming the GP, jpeg so in this case we have to introduce the on processing and the isp and the things just to know this and then just introduce this one then we find that our model is really worth so other solution is like the we uh, can based on the this physical model. So we also try try to directly change the dark image into the light one. We can say that later late in night uh, apply our method. It is always light. So the advantage of this method is it's only 90k parameters and runs very fast. So please like the, go to our GitHub and download it to have a try. Maybe it will give you a lot of like the it will help your current method. Another bottleneck in computer vision is called scale, scale variance. For example, like when the, some object is large and all some object is extremely small. So normally it's the, a, a, a one convolution network could not handle it. So similarly, we just propose a new very novel idea saying, well, why don't we use the resolution as self-supervision signal? Basically, what we are doing is like the, the verse is a similar, is a, exactly the same. So we have an image, then we just change it to different size and put it to the network during the pre-training. Then we use the like the super resolution model to during the, to decode the signal back to the original size. If it has, it has, if the image can be successfully decoded, which means that this feature itself, this manifold itself should also be invariant to the scale. So based on this idea, then we just have a quick successfully, like uh, make the, endow the model of robustness to the scale change. And like, I, I think that the cool part is this one is like, it's work on mainstream CNN and transformer architecture. Then it only leads to minimal modification during training and during the inferior stage. 
there's nothing to be changed. So this is our work published in the ECCV and we name it as Alice to like in memorize to the Final Fantasy. And finally, we also have to do some practical ones like to consider 3D vision on the radiation. So this is like we use a knowledge distillation to borrow the knowledge from, to borrow the information, to transfer information from 2D. And then finally, so also I want to say there is a gap among the human, um, also there is a gap among humans because for us, like in the de developed countries, so we think that the AI like that depends on, we can use that AI uh, use on the expensive GPU cards over $2,000 and reliable power supply. We still take it as grant, but in for robot, robot or in poor res resource poor country, it's very difficult to have the nice GPU and reliable power su supply. So for this one, inspired by some nature, like the by neuroscience, like inspired by some research on the neuroscience, we have developed our own FPGA, which is much, much faster and much like 10 times efficient gain, like the if, if, 10 times energy efficient than the other ones. The final one I want to say, oh, luckily I catch the time, that there is a gap in heart. So like now it's important to use, uh, to, to discuss, we have to have the trust towards artificial intelligence because the AI is may, mostly a black box. So it lacks the transparency, privacy, the transparency, privacy and data, data governance. And, and also the fairness is very important, especially from the government's point. So what we are doing is like we try we, in this triple AI, we propose a systematic uh, solution to protect the privacy and enhance the fairness from the camera to the end user. How do we do that? It's very simple. We just uh, change the human face in the camera. We change the human face and use the flow model to change the face to another people's face and pa before passing it to the user. So for most of the task, like the action recognition or like the gate recognition, you don't need to know the face. So the privacy is protected. Another advantage is like if this face, since all the face like are changed, so it keeps on fairness. It won't be discriminated against the, like the African people or Asians. So if the user really need to know the face information, then he can go just go to, we can give him, he can use our key to decode the image to decode the image and become, let their face come back. Because like this is thanks to the advantage of the uh, property of the like flow model because it's inverse. Okay, the final thing is like, we make the deep fake for good finally. Okay, thank you for your listening and we shall have you a good night. <laughs>